<laughs> so I've got this drawer full of socks that I just happen to carry around with me. And so you never know when you're going to need some socks, right? So imagine this. I need a pair of socks, and I need them to match, but I'm not going to let myself look in the drawer. So think for yourself, how many pulls will it be before I'm guaranteed uh, to get a pair? Okay, so the first one's black, um, and the second one happens to be white this time. Um, sure enough, I did not get a pair, but on my third pull, I have a black one. So what sort of thinking is this? Well, picture for yourself an empty box. Uh, the first box, kind of like a pigeonhole or an empty space. So into the first box, you must put white or black. And in the second box, you must put white or black. Um, so in the third box, you are guaranteed to have a pair. So that's mathematical thinking. And indeed, um, that problem comes to us from, from Martin Gardner, who wrote thousands of those for Scientific American um, and in his books. Uh, and so he believed that all of us should have the pleasure of playing with big and powerful mathematical ideas. And I believe that too. And that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, so I just happen to also be carrying around um, jumbo oversized novelty dice. Uh, and actually, I also have green ones, but today I have these black ones. And you know, if you've ever played any board games for any length of time, you probably have a certain intuition that a to seven, that is a total of seven, comes up a lot. Uh, and that's kind of like the easy outcome for a lot of different games. And you might have the sense also that two and 12 don't tend to come up a lot. But I'll say this, seven doesn't get you out of jail uh, in Monopoly, okay? Um, this time, and it comes up eight. So I didn't get seven, but imagine for yourself a bar graph with all the possible outcomes. So two, all the way up to seven, which indeed incurs the most, occurs the most, all the way back down to 12. It's very symmetrical. Um, so they're most possible outcomes that can make seven. And so I think that's something really interesting to talk about, and it involves mathematical thinking, and it's in our play. So what do I believe for kids? I think that kids and adults should, have, should all feel the power and pleasure of playing with their mathematics. I mean, think about it. Math should be a thinking tool and not just a subject in school. And it should give us pleasure. So we're humans, we're thinking beings. Um, we're born to think and we're born to play. So I want a pedagogy of mathematics where kids say, this is surprising and it's wonderful. And it fills me with joy and it's awe-inspiring. So the exact opposite of what some of you may have experienced, hopefully not too many. And it leaves me this, with this sense of wonder at just how, um, just how amazing it actually is. That's what I want for all of us. And then, so what do kids say? If you have any kids, you might want to ask them this question later. And kids say interesting things when you do ask them. Melissa Penner and students in Brampton in grade three said this. They said all of these things. So sure enough, they said math is fractions and uh, time. And, and math is cookies, because for grade three, there's a, there's a lot of cookie math and a lot of problems about cookies, right? So time, money, fractions, this is all so important, but you'll notice most of all um, that they said that math is fun. And we want that for all kids. You know, and then think for yourself, what is mathematics really? Because you may just have experienced it in school. So, we, we might come to definitions like it's the science of patterns, and that works, depending on what type of mathematician you are. Um, the science of shape, space, quantity, and arrangements, that works, depending what kind of mathematician you are. But we want to know what, what kids say. So kids are born to wonder, and, and this is our human birthright, because uh, we're thinking beings, and we're just born into this unending stream of consciousness from birth till death, that's what I say. And these two who happen to be my sons are always wondering. So their, their life is a constant state of wonderment um, from birth on. And why should that ever stop at the door of math class, which has some of the most big, massive, world-changing and surprising ideas. Uh, so thinking about this arrangement of, deck of, of a deck of cards, so 
This deck happens to be brand new, so it's perfectly ordered, so, and it'll never be more perfectly ordered. So um, the Ace of Spades is actually on the bottom. And so every time I shuffle it and deal it out from here, um, it's going to be in a different arrangement. So let's think about that. Yeah, they didn't fly as far as I wanted, so some of them are still in order. But if you were to perfectly shuffle them, like with a shuffling machine, and deal them out again, there's a decent chance that that arrangement has never happened on this planet. Like in all the recreational poker games, all the games of Go Fish, uh, and so on. So picture for yourself the same visualization tool. Just make it an empty box this time. And so we could place any one of 52 cards in that empty box. That leaves 51 to go, and 50, and so on, all the way down to the last card. Well, because the counting principle has us multiply, we can multiply 52 times 51 and times 50, and so on. And all of a sudden, there's more possible arrangements of that deck um, than there are atoms in the, in the universe. And that's absolutely astounding. You could not duplicate that flip of a deck of cards if you tried. And I think that's an idea worth playing with. And speaking of really, really large numbers, have you ever asked a kid what's the biggest number you know? And so when they're little, they might just say five, okay, because they've learned one, two, many, one, two, and many, so they might know five cookies or five blocks. Later, they'll say a hundred, and then they'll get the sense of a million. And then there, there'll always be some kid who's just heard of infinity, because it's out there, and they'll say infinity. And then some kid will say, oh yeah, the biggest number I know is infinity and one. This is the sort of thing that kids love to talk about. Um, they just love it. And so, we are counting beings, and this is my son counting. That's not really infinity. How many do you think it is? Um, I said we're counting beings because kids love to count. They, just, they love to count and they know it, but it's this concept of infinity that disrupts our idea of what counting actually is, right? So what's in a set? So what is infinity? Dr. Eugenia Cheng in her great book, Beyond Infinity, says infinity goes on forever, infinity is bigger than any number, infinity is bigger than anything we can think of, and if you add one to it, it's still infinity. So all of a sudden, our sense of one, two, three, and so on, it's completely broken. And indeed, arithmetic breaks when we work with infinity. But kids want to know about this sort of thing, and it belongs in classrooms. So Jennifer Santos, who also is grade sevens, said infinity is indescribable. It's just the idea of a number. Um, and so therefore, they figured this out, okay, that you subtract one, it's still going to be infinity. And in my experience, kids want to know about these sorts of things. And so I want to no limits mathematics for kids. So if we think about it, if we define our imagination as having no limits, um, then probably it is limitless, what we can do with mathematics. And indeed, the mathematical world, which I've just read so much about recently, there are so many more things, interesting things, than they ever taught us in school. I want that for kids. And so after 15 years of teaching mathematics, I'm just thinking about what are my actual pedagogical principles. And I think, first of all, we've got to know the curriculum. Even more importantly, know the big ideas of the math behind it. Second of all, just give kids interesting tasks and let them play. Give kids interesting mathematics to play with, let them play. Let them talk and think and conjecture and wonder. Let them play. And so Dr. Kathy Bruce defines a, a pedagogy of playful mathematics as a kind of guided play with teachers guiding children through um, the big and powerful ideas of mathematics. And I think we can have that in our classrooms. So for me, uh, a pedagogy of playful mathematics is all about kids talking about interesting things. It is kids talking about talking to each other and making conjectures about things like infinity. It is kids playing with numbers. It is kids using mathematical thinking to break things down to their, their basic level. Um, so, Dr. Francis Sue says in his absolutely astounding talk called Mathematics for Human Flourishing, 
which he gave as outgoing president of the Mathematical Association of America. Well, he says he situates play as one of five basic human needs, and he says that play gives hope. Play builds hope. And so if we define mathematics as a playful endeavor, if we say mathematics is play, then it should follow that math gives hope as well. And indeed, this talk was about an inmate who used mathematics to better himself, so literally was able to build mathematical worlds for himself to escape confinement, all the bars and barbed wire, and later to make a career when he was no longer incarcerated. Um, but kids know all about play, okay? It's us who have forgotten, or maybe some of us have. So we go to work and there's going to be 42 unread emails, 22 of them have that exclamation point beside that means you must read me now. There's three meetings happening, your boss wants something, um, you need to get your car into the shop for its oil change, and there's swimming lessons and so on. Um, but kids know. So try interrupting them when they're, when they're in this deep state of play. If they're like my children, they forget to eat, even to go to the bathroom sometimes, which is a problem. But this could be making something with Lego, making something with Lego or um, playing with stuffed animals or creating a world with action figures or just playing in that bush that's beside your house. They don't want to stop. So they're in this deep state of flow, what the Hungarian psychologist Shesh Mihaly calls flow, where you're beyond time, time seems to disappear, and you're just doing it. And you're, you're deriving so much pleasure from it, everything disappears, the, world's out, the world outside. And think about for us, when do we get into that state of flow? And so what I'm feeling right now is that we do need to just play. For the parents out there, we need to play board games, dice games with our kids, um, card games. We can do all the spatial things like Lego and blocks, um, find the math in the world around us when we're shopping. It's there for us to find. Play with it. And for the adults who maybe don't have kids, there's so much out there now. Let's find a book by Alex Bellows, for example, who writes for The Guardian, or a book by Martin Gardner. And let's find some interesting math to play with. And let's teach ourselves to think mathematically. Remember I said, mathematics is a thinking tool, not just something that you learn in school. And we should all play with the big and powerful ideas of mathematics. And I'm actually going to leave you with this. Um, the penny toss is guaranteed not to fail, like the card toss did. Um, that may have made some point about probability, but it wasn't the point I wanted to make. But so I'm, now, if I can, I've just notated heads with an H, and if I toss this, and if I land in a configuration where I'm able to gather up 20 heads, then I'm prepared to pay $1 million to everyone in this audience. Okay, that's the heads, it's the maple leaf. And you know what? I'm not even going to say I got lucky because I knew I wasn't paying off on that bet. And you could think about how I knew that. So in summary, let us play with the big and powerful ideas of mathematics. Thank you very much.